Hi, I'm, my name is Matthew Deans. I'm a work, I work for the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. I'm the Supported Employment and Project Search Coordinator for the state. Um, today I'll be talking about the transition to independent living and community participation with regards to transition students. Um, our agency, the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, provides a variety of services to students and to support youth with disabilities to help them pursue their independent living through competitive employment in the community once they graduate high school. We have uh, transition services support the students in the movement from school to work and into the community and to adult life. There's a variety of ways that students can access the program. Um, the first most typical way is to contact the school counselor or their case manager within the school systems to let them know that they're interested in employment and that they would like to pursue services with our agency. Um, the, the, the secondary way would be to contact the office directly. Uh, each, each entity or each school system has a, uh, a field office with the Department for Aging and Rehab Services that is associated with that school. Uh, so you can call the 1-800 number on the slide displayed uh, and someone can patch you through to the local office based on where you live. You may apply for services with the vo 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 Vocational Rehabilitation Program um, if you qualify for services. We are an eligibility-based program, um, and so we have a, a variety of different uh, qualifications that you must meet in order for, to, for you to receive services from us. Um, just to gla glance over these uh, slightly, the first one is to, that you have to have a physical, mental, or emotional disability of some sort. Uh, the disability must present a barrier to employment, and so the, um, it, it, in some way the disability keeps you from finding or keeping a job. The, uh, the, the third qualification is that you're willing and able to work, and you think our services can help you. And the last one is that, you're in, that you live in the state of Virginia, or that you're going to be moving to Virginia. So, and one of the things that we wanted to know was what are the top three essential skills that you wish students with uh, developed, who had developed before they exited school. I worked as a transition counselor for several years in Chesterfield County. Um, I worked in both with an adult, per, adult caseload and then also with a transition caseload. Uh, and that, that caseload also allowed me to interface with the project search program. We won't get into that. Um, but in my experience, I felt that the um, the, the, the top three essential skills for folks e exiting school uh, that, that I see as a gap was that de they had demonstrated work skills. That's, uh, there's a, a variety of ways to do that. Obviously getting a job, um, and, and when I was growing up, which wasn't too long ago, I graduated high school in 2000, but before I graduated high school, I had already held a job. I had had a part-time job working at the local fast food place, the Wendy's actually. Um, I had uh, done a variety of things in, the, in my neighborhood, babysitting and cutting grass. Uh, so when I left school, I had uh, demonstrated work skills that I could refer to uh, employers and had provide references. Um, in my experience these days, it seems that that's not as big a priority as it used to be. Folks are exiting school with, um, with, the, with a diploma uh, but the, um, or, or a special education diploma. Um, but they have uh, delayed the process of, of getting into the employment world. Um, so we have um, a variety of things that, are, that present barriers to folks with disabilities. The, the number one, no matter where you go, is, is transportation. Um, I, I often joke when I meet people is what's the, the second question I ask them, what's your, what's your name and how do you plan on getting to work? Um, because it is such a, uh, an imp a barrier to employment in, in most areas in Virginia. Whether you have a public a transportation system or not, it's still a barrier to folks who, with disabilities who may need to get additional training on, on how to access that public transportation system, uh, how to understand the schedule, how to transfer from bus to bus, how that may impact your employment, uh, how you would tell your employer, uh, this, is, this is what I, the shift I need to work based on the transportation that I have in place. And obviously the, the, the other option would be to learn how to drive um, and, and another difference in my uh, days I'm seeing nowadays is folks are delaying that process of getting a driver's license. I think I've, I've read a statistic somewhere that the, the, the average um, license issued for, uh, for young people is at 18 or 19 years old now. Um, I was eager, jumping at the bit to get my license when I turned 16. 
because that was my ticket out, you know, out into the world, into employment. So as soon as I got a license, I went to work and, and was able to get to and from on my own. It opened up a lot of doors for myself. Um, but the, I understand that the folks with disabilities have uh, difficulty learning those skills. It is a challenge. It, is a, it can create a lot of anxiety and fears for people. Uh, but it is something that uh, we've seen uh, very successful programs just providing a little bit of help, a little bit of support through the um, studying the manual, the driver's manual, and uh, helping them set up accommodations when they do the testing at the DMV site. Uh, that's another uh, support that we provide too. Very, it's very easy to do. Uh, they're very friendly staff and they're willing to help uh, folks who need accommodations in, in the testing process. And I would say the last would be the self-determination skills. Uh, folks with, uh, with these types of skills have uh, ownership of their plan. They have an understanding of what their goals are. Uh, they need to, um, they, they know what services they need based on, the, based on their understanding of themselves and their disability. Uh, that's a huge uh, qualification for folks with disabilities. As a person that, with a disability myself, you may not be able to see the wheelchair, but I do have a mobility impairment since I was 16 years old. I was in a car accident. So I have uh, learned how to communicate to my employers what my needs are. Uh, and help them understand and sometimes relieve them in a lot of ways to let them know that I'm very independent, I'm very mobile, um, I have a variety of ways of getting around, I have canes and crutches and braces and wheelchairs and, uh, so I can get from place to place in, uh, with uh, a little bit of hard-headedness. But um, So th these are, as I said, these are some of the, the essential skills I think that, that youth with disabilities exiting the high school and exiting into the work world uh, really would benefit more from. Top three tips you have for special educators and their help, as they help prepare students for living or participating in the community. Um, I worked with the school systems. Um, most of the time, we would interface with, with, with schools during the IEP meeting, and that was an annual meeting, typically done in the springtime. Uh, IEP season is what we called it. And uh, everybody would come around the table and the team would, would sit down and go over the IEP. Sometimes they're very long meetings. Uh, they can last an hour to two hours depending on how much is gone over. Um, the, the IEP itself is, can be 15 or 20 pages long uh, with all the different in, uh, information that's in there. Um, so we, uh, you know, I, I tip for, for folks is to uh, refer to DARS or our agency as early as possible. Uh, there is no, um, there's no too early, I would say, uh, when they start to enter high school uh, in their second year or, or three years out from graduation is usually our rule of thumb. But we, I understand by saying that uh, graduation can be sometimes a moving target for some people. If they're having difficulty passing SOLs, they may stay an extra year, which would then delay that, that graduation date. So uh, you may think uh, we've got time and then you get to the end and you realize that we haven't, um, we've been working on these SOLs and now it's time to, to leave, exit high school, because you may be aging out. And that's when they usually will refer to us. To us. And so folks with, uh, with significant disabilities do require a, a, a great deal of uh, support. Um, and, and we typically like to start off with a, um, a diagnostics and assessments. Um, so those take time as well. Um, we have a, a program here in Virginia called the PERT program. It stands for a post-education post-secondary education rehabilitation transition program. And it's basically a two-week long-term um, assessment uh, where folks will go to Woodrow Wilson Rehabilitation Center, which is a training center here in Virginia sponsored by uh, the state. And it's, it's kind of a sister agency to, to our voc vocational rehabilitation program. So they work with transition students to help them uh, try to get some sort of uh, experience in, in their in employment interests uh, based on the training programs they have there at Woodrow. So those, um, those PERT programs are constant. There are a certain number of slots for each school system. And so if you don't uh, get in the first round, you have to wait till the next round in order to get to, get to Woodrow to do that. Those are crucial assessments, and I think they're very helpful for the team to understand what, how to prepare someone who's, a, say, a sophomore or junior exiting high school uh, and, and to put place uh, curriculum changes in place within the schools, if possible, uh, targeting services with DARS uh, when they're ready to exit, and so that takes time. Uh, so second uh, recommendation I would, I would have would, would be to, um, to try to have realistic employment and career-focused IPEs. 
or I, I think that's a typo, I meant to say IEPs. Um, when I say realistic, I say that with, uh, with some caution. Uh, I'm not the, I, I never was the type of counselor to say no to someone who had a goal. Um, folks with, young folks who have li limited uh, interface with the employment world or the experience of employment uh, have a limited understanding of what is available to them. Uh, but uh, so often people will um, latch onto their interests based on uh, their, their experience or their parents' employment uh, and their, their um, understanding of what they do. Um, and so when someone is interested in perhaps being a video game designer or, or tester, uh, which is a, is a common goal because people like to play video games, and they say, well, why not make this a job? That's a great idea. Uh, we would all love to make our, our interests, uh, our love, our hobbies, uh, our jobs. So um, that's, there, is, uh, there is employment for that. Um, it is uh, competitive. Uh, it tends to be gravitating in, in different parts of the country. So helping people understand when they say they want to do this job, it is a physical job somewhere in the labor market. And our job is to help them understand what to, what to expect when, when they start to look for those employment uh, options, what the training needs will be, what to expect when they get to, that, get to work eventually, uh, what the environment will be like, um, how much education will they need, and ongoing education. Oftentimes in the computer world, uh, they need uh, continuing education uh, to stay on top of the, of the technology. Um, so having uh, the, the third tip I would say would be to not only refer, but also follow up. Um, often, I, I remember uh, in the IEP meetings I would be in, uh, the discussions about what services or agencies they would need after high school to live in the community, such as perhaps Social Security Administration services or benefits with the Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, uh, which is, uh, is, a, is a somewhat critical independent living benefit for folks to, in order for them to live, we know that they're going to be uh, severely disabled and it's probably going to impact their ability to work full time and to, and to live independently. And that uh, benefits and from the other agencies could be helpful to help them provide that little bit of support while they try to expo uh, explore the world of work. Um, and so that process can take quite a, quite a bit of time. Uh, it, it depends on the situation, uh, it depends on what the disability is. Uh, not everybody qualifies who, who applies, but the, those benefits impact our benefits and our services. Uh, for example, our eligibility requirements are um, somewhat expedited when, when folks have uh, an SSI benefits already. So we can assume that they have a disability, that it impacts their ability to work, because that's the eligibility requirements for SSI. So we just need to get documentation of that and uh, we, can, we can usually process their eligibility certificates pretty quickly once we know that. Um, the other aspect that, to that is when we're looking at benefits uh, for uh, cost services. We have a variety of no-cost services or in-house services, such as counseling and guidance from, from your transition counselor, uh, but we also often need additional services that have an out-of-pocket expense, such as supported employment or job coaching. Uh, and so when in, in Virginia, in our agency, we've taken it upon ourselves to require that folks uh, present, um, demonstrate that they need, uh, they need support from us in order to help with their financial participation. Uh, our assumption is that every client uh, participates in the, in financially in, in their services unless they are exempt or they, need, they um, demonstrate that they uh, they have um, benefits from other agencies that would, that would also be considered an exemption. So if you have SSI, we automatically um, will uh, cover your cost, no, your cost services, uh, such as job coaching. And those services can be very expensive. Um, sometimes people get caught up in the uh, young folks living with their parents and having a household income being considered as part of their income, and that can hurt them sometimes because now all of a sudden, um, uh, you know, a middle class income, two, two, two income families uh, with one child, uh, it it's puts them over the limit that we have uh, set uh, based on the poverty line. And so unfortunately, they have to pay for the job coaching hours unless we can change their financial situation along the way. Uh, so it's important that, that uh, the IEP teams meet, they talk about what services are, that they explain what they are, uh, what the requirements are for the eligibility, 
and why they need them. Uh, sometimes folks will come to our agency and they don't know why they were referred, but they're here. Uh, some, sometimes people will not truly understand what SSI is, what Social Security is. There's a lot of stigmas around that, uh, and, I, and I can understand why folks would want to uh, perhaps try to do it on their own, uh, but it's, it's something that we've experienced in a lot of different ways. But um, So that wraps up my presentation. Thank you very much.